Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? This is Ben yes. speaking. Wonderful. Right. Welcome. Let us uh, wait for another minute or so. Uh, I see that uh, people are still logging in uh, and then we get started. Fantastic. I see we have six participants at the moment, so let us wait noch, uh, a minute or so. Uh, we should have around at least 15 or so. Let's just wait a moment. Meanwhile, yeah, people looking in, excellent. All right. I would say, since our time is quite limited, let's get started. So um, uh, nice to, uh, to have you all with us um, to this webinar and to this discussion group on, uh, on live cell imaging. So thank you for your interest in that. And so I hope that you enjoyed that, that uh, webinar uh, around the workflows and processes so um, to make good use of the time, 
um, we thought that we would give you a brief, very, very brief introduction on, on live cell imaging, and then that we use the time for questions that you may have. We is um, uh, Dr. Dutoy, uh, Andre, who is um, a veteran uh, microscopist and fluorescent microscopist, uh, and um, who has done a tremendous amount of work on the focal and on, uh, on the white field in various techniques. And uh, myself, uh, I've been in the imaging field since, since uh, many, many years. Uh, so yeah, so we look forward. And um, so I think I will now screen share briefly. Oh, Naomi, you're also there, fantastic. I, I know some of you, so very nice. Um, so let me briefly um, share two, three slides with you. Uh, Andre will then um, also show some examples and uh, we then have time for, for questions. Does it sound all right? You have not much choice, unfortunately. <laughs> right, so um, just very quickly. Are you able to... Just a second. Are you able to see these slides? Yes, we can see the slides. Excellent. Thank you, Jenna. Perfect. Uh, so now the, the theme is live cell imaging, and I want to keep it very brief. But what I want to say is, of course, uh, the advantage of live cell imaging is that it allows you to describe processes like here, uh, mitochondrial events or vesicle trafficking in real time as they happen. So that, of course, allows you to describe the dynamics of these processes so that the types of data that you generate is very different to, you know, to uh, um, just images at certain times that where you may perform some morphological analysis. So through live cell imaging, you are able to assess when a certain event occurs, right? So, and that is typically, so you have fluorescence intensity over time, which means that your data will become something like uh, um, a particular response curves. So you're able to analyze these curves, um, slopes, uh, plateau phases, and so forth. And, um, and hence, it's, it's the, the kind of data is very different and very powerful because um, very often you want to understand when and to what magnitude a cellular system is responding to you know, a drug treatment or whatever you may be doing, um, as opposed to just knowing that it had responded and this is how that then looked like at a certain time. So live cell imaging is very, very powerful. But of course, and that's the second thing that I want to mention is that, uh, of course, it is uh, um, very, very, it's a very sensitive matter. In other words, you need to know yourself very well and you need to uh, understand the, the protocols very well, the probes. Um, of course, you would have to use probes that are suitable for live cell imaging. So inherent binding curves, uh, uh, inherent binding probes, uh, plasmids and so forth. And, um, and you need to keep in mind that the cell is um, responding to environmental stressors. So temperature control is very important. Uh, phototoxicity through the uh, acquisition on the confocal could be uh, an issue. Bleaching could be an issue. But most important is the, the handling of the cells themselves. And here I just want to indicate uh, mitochondria so uh, we are doing a lot of mitochondrial imaging work and these mitochondrial networks respond within seconds to a small decrease in temperature or th uh, to some mechanical you know, stimulation, some you know, bumping on the dish or so. It's very, very sensitive. Here's an example where we use photoactivation for mitochondrial dynamics. So we activate particular proteins and then see how they distribute in these mitochondria over time 
as an indication for these dynamics. And um, my last slide um, is that, of course, um, you have this major advantage in live cell imaging uh, by uh, um, assessing processes at a very good and high temporal resolution. In other words, you're able to pick up changes way before the cellular system is responding with proteins. An example here again, fission and fusion proteins, for those that know mitochondrial control, these proteins uh, you know, control the, uh, the kind of the sharing of mitochondrial proteins, whether they're more in a fused state or in a segregated um, state. However, to, to um, detect that on, you know, on, a, on a blot, for example, um, is, uh, happens many hours later and visually, the mitochondria may have changed completely already. So you have a major advantage there to detect processes very quickly. So with that, that's, that's all I wanted to share. And uh, Andre has uh, also prepared a few slides. Andre, let me stop sharing here. And then you can uh, share some Thank of you. your... Uh, I'll pretty much, well, Ben pretty much covered most of it. So I'll pretty much at this point just be showing some pretty pictures. Um, so I thought I will run through a nice image series I have, and then we can just walk through it and see what you guys think. Let's take it from there. There we go. All right. Yeah, excellent. Ben, can you see? Yes, perfect. Okay, so this is one of my favorite images I took a few years ago. Um, I think I'm going to run through the dyes and then I will go through the, um, yeah, the internet's not the greatest at this point, so please interrupt if I'm going too fast or you guys missed something. So this is a nice MEF cell. I can get out of the site with data sets and, and important considerations when you do this. So this is mouse embryonic fibroblast cells. In red, we have the tubulin. So that is the highway, so the skeleton of the cell. And then in green, we have your autophagosomes. So this is, so the tubulin is a dye. The um, autophagosomes is GFP LC3 um, construct. So it's a LC3 protein linked with GFP is diffused in the, in the um, cell, and then it gets incorporated into the autophagosomes, forming these green dots. So how does this look like? So sort of, we've got a nice pretty picture there. We can see where the color collides. But as Ben mentioned earlier, that with live cell imaging, you can get a lot more. You can see the dynamic nature of a system. So if I press player, you can see it's coming to life. You can see now, not only the co localized, but they run along the tubular networks, and you can start getting really interesting data out of it. For instance, the velocities, where it is moving, and you can do this also in response to drugs. Because, for instance, um, during periods of um, a fed state of a cell, if it's in its physiological state, is you have a nice homogeneous um, distribution of your autophagosomes, but upon starvation or stimulation, you find it, it then quickly goes to the perinuclear region where your lysosomes reside. And that forms part of the lysosome or the activated system. So again, you can pull out a lot of nice data from it. And then just these two simple dyes, we can see not only how the, right, how the autophagosomes, sorry, autophagosomes behave, but also how the tubular network behaves. You can very nicely see, for instance here, how it starts to bend and um, a bend, oh, reshape itself in order to more effectively move traffic or autophagosomes. Um, in this case, you can see these little vacuolar structures. Um, and yeah, so you can really mine a lot of data out of this. And there's a lot of consideration when one comes to this because while this is adding a few dry, sorry, dyes are quite simple, you must also take into account temperature, um, the, um, the humidity of the chamber, chamber, which needs to be controlled because otherwise it can lead to cell being stressed and it can warp your data or the results or taint it. Um, so yeah, this is just GFPLC3, this is all the and tubular. And I've got another one here, which I 
let me see if I still have this one. We reduced the, the, the acquisition time or made the acquisition time longer and increased the, the, um, time, decreased the time frames so that we can get higher resolution of tubular networks. And then in the background, you can see the mitochondria. So again, these are nice live cell dyes, which we previously had to test to make sure that there's no cytos um, cytotoxic effects. I want to continue to do that using DMSO to see how that adversely might affect the cells since most of these dyes are, are made up in that. Um, and yeah, again, you can see very nicely how the mitochondria runs along the tubular network. And what I like about this data set, you can I actually caught in the right time where it was pulsating. Um, Yes. And yeah, that's pretty much uh, what I want to share. That was almost my time. Um, yes. Ben? Wonderful. Yes, Andre, thank you so much. So, um, yeah, so as you can see here, what Andre has shown were also ben? pattern cells. I'm oh, sorry, that cut off. Sorry. Yeah, so no, I can hear you. Uh, you have seen Andre has shown pattern oh, yeah. cells, um, so one is able to. That's a nice. So these are. So this is very nice. That's, this is a pattern. So these these cells yeah. were, I printed of the yeah, printed proteins onto a cover slip, where um, which forces the cells only to attach there, and the back full is filled with um, poly, polyethylene glycol. So you essentially are well, indirectly printing cells then onto the. On to covers so I can force their shapes. In this case, they were all forced to have a fixed diameter of 50 microns. And this is to, to increase the um, repeatability or re, uh, the reproducibility of an experiment and also to tighten those error curves since the cell shape can dramatically influence um, data analysis and distribution and stuff like that. So here we standardize it to improve accuracy. Excellent. So you can see that, of course, very often one of the major aims is to do quantitative analysis. And it depends a bit how important it is or how finely you want to control uh, parameters. And here controlling the shape of the cell can, can assist in, in really um, uh, reducing the, just the variability. But um, this is a, a particular niche um, that, that can be followed. It's, it's, it requires a particular uh, application, of course. Wonderful. Andre, thank you very much. So we have now time for questions. Ben, I just think you need to unmute them. Oh, must I unmute? Maybe. I think, I think, so I would, so I think everyone can, can unmute. Uh, you can unmute yourself. We are few enough, so the system should hold that. I don't think that I can unmute you from here. Uh, no, Jenna, you can, you could unmute yourself. Yeah, everyone should be able to unmute themselves. Yeah, good, good, good. Excellent. Right, so, so far to live cell imaging from your living room. So, so yeah, um, Use the time, any, any thoughts, any questions? Where are you at? Are you planning experiments? Are you, you know, uh, considering um, a, a life cell component? Um, let us know. We are here for you. Prof. Lewis, can, I, um, can everyone hear me? Yes, yes, Nadia, yes. excellent. Um, so sorry, I only came into the meeting because there was a delay in my re receiving the link. I just wanted to confirm whether this was recorded and whether we could get it afterwards. Yes, this is recorded and, and I will send it uh, straight after, uh, after the meeting. Okay, as well. perfect. And then I don't know if this was mentioned, but um, I also, I'm doing some, just testing some toxicity on the cell of the compound phenylalanine of the amino acid. Um, I just wanted to know what would be the best way to visualize the impact on the cell of the amino acid in a microscopic context. In terms of viability? Yes. Yeah, so um, that is a, is, a, is a good question. Andre, do you want to kickstart? Um, microscopically or just assay-wise? Because usually one would start with something like an MTT 
or so, an essay? Yes, we're, we're doing the um, essays and everything first, but it would be nice just to have some qualitative data as well, just to back it up, just as a very nice visual support as well. I yeah. suppose one could use um, uh, mitochondria dyes to see how, or, yeah, just, just to give an idea of the reductive capacity of it as, a, as an indicator of health as well. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good idea. I think that's a, yeah, a good place to start. I haven't done, actually done anything much beyond that when it comes to just general viability. Okay, so mitochondrial staining would probably be a good place to start for that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And it depends a little bit on, on the kind of, uh, you know, stress, uh, Nadia. So typically, um, you know, you would, if you want to, for example, assess whether your, um, your intervention leads to membrane integrity loss. Then yes, that specifically. We, we think thus far it's more focused on membrane integrity and probably yes. just on sterile synthesis as well within the membrane. I see. So there are, of course, in probes, they're like propidium iodide that is used to as exclusion assay. So you would see if the membrane is lost uh, in its integrity that this PI stain intercalates with the DNA. So the nucleus becomes red. That okay. would kind of, you know, uh, indicate functionally to you that the membrane is, you know, uh, impaired. Um, and then, of course, in terms of stress, um, so the mitochondria is a very good one because they're very sensitive. And if there is an issue, then they would cluster or they would aggregate or they could fragment. Um, so, of course, it's very important with mitochondria to have a, a, a good control that you, you know, that you um, have really, that is uh, in 37 degrees in media, so really happy because the mitochondria can fragment so easily just because maybe the temperature is off for, you know, for a while. Okay. And, and um, then, of course, you know, there are in terms of stress, that means there is this necrotic type of cell death, there is apoptosis, so there could be, you know, one could stain for a caspase or for nuclear condensation. Often stress is also assessed or viability with reactive oxygen species where there are uh, uh, fluorescent probes for. And uh, then elegant is, of course, to do it so that you can combine probes. So let's say you take a mito mitochondrial probe that is in the far red, you use the propidium iodide that is in the red, and then you use a rust tracker that is in the green. And then you have okay. your nuclear probe for you know, condensation in the blue. So you really maximize you know, the fluorescent panel and the functional readout that you can get through it. Okay. And then, yeah, because I joined late, would it be fine if I just um, went over the discussion and then if I have any more related or more specific questions, if any of that pops up, would it be fine if I just emailed you? Sure. We are, okay, we are available for that. <laughs> Thanks so much. Absolutely. Yes, good. Very nice. What, what else? Um, maybe just very quickly. So, in terms of stress response, uh, Nadia. So, um, yes. it, you know, so one could do this post intervention, but what could one could also do it? It depends how you know how rapid the response is. One could also do it really in life, so that you, you know, you have your cells untreated under the microscope with the probes in the environment. Then you treat them under the microscope whilst you are acquiring. So that you are assessing how, for example, you know, reactive oxygen species increases or when the membrane becomes, uh, you know, uh, permeable. So that's, of course, where the life cell component could come into. Yes. Okay, great. Excellent. Right. Charles, I saw the, a picture coming on there. Is there a question? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Uh... Thanks, thanks, Pro, for the nice presentation. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah, uh, I really enjoyed. Um, I'm considering doing a life cell imaging experiment. Yes. Um, I'm from the University of Johannesburg, and we are working on uh, some work to do with anti-cancer studies. So, <clears throat> I was wondering what could be the logistics of uh, 
running these particular experiments in your university, um, I find it exciting for me, and I thought we could probably uh, do some work on this part, life cell imaging with respect to cancer to get more information about how our compounds are responding. Absolutely. Um, when, when, when exposed to the cells. Yes. yes. So I, I'm sorry, I don't know, my internet seems to be unstable. I don't know whether you can hear me well. I can hear you. Okay, okay, thank you. So yes, could Charles. Could you please uh, maybe share? Yeah. Sure. So, Charles, that is that is absolutely possible. The unit that Lisa is managing is an open user platform, so it is open for a, uh, okay. anyone in the country. The easiest would be to email yes. her to get that rolling. You email her the, uh, indicating that you're interested in utilizing the facility in this and this context, and then you know then the uh, the discussion can be kickstarted to what extent you know, there would be assistance required or questions. So typically, Lisa will assist in uh, experimental design if that, if need be. Uh, so that is all possible. Okay, okay, that, that, that's awesome. So, <laughs> yeah, I look forward to uh, probably sending you some queries and some discussion related questions, yeah. Excellent. Uh, it's a nice presentation. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, just for interest, Charles, what, what um, cells are you working with? Yeah, we are working with a panel of cancer cells. Um, with the currently, panel. we are four years. So, we are working with HEK, X293, LA cells. MT4, the leukemia cells, and um, we, we, we also had um, these kidney cells, BHK. Okay, okay. Yes. So, so I think, I, I don't know if it will be possible for to also access headlines from your, from your end. Or... Yeah, that, that has to be, um, you know, discussed with Lisa. Um, in some cases that can be uh, possible, uh, that is then usually through some kind of collaborative agreement if cell you know, types or cell lines are made available. So that's not part of the standard kind of yes. service. Um, but I, it's, you know, it doesn't harm to yes, inquire yes. that and then you know, that, uh, that it can be taken further. Okay, okay, fine, thank you. <laughs> Excellent. So, we have still one more minute left if we have to stick very tightly to the schedule. Hi, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, um, I actually have a question. It's in relation to my project. So essentially, um, what I'm focusing on is understanding um, a multi-species ecosystem by assessing cell-to-cell -cell interactions and the population dynamics. And essentially, I'll be looking at the role of the cell wall protein families in yeast. And I was wondering if you know, live cell imaging might be beneficial for my project, um, particularly with the knockout study. Um, so part of what, what I'll actually be doing is um, kind of eliminating one of the elements, so one of the genes that we're trying to figure out what it does, what role it plays in this, and kind of getting an image of the before and after. So with, with the gene and without it, and then kind of trying to establish whether or not it does play an essential role. Because right now, there isn't much information on these genes and what it, kind of role it plays. So I'm just wondering, um, if this would be a good approach or to rather stick with the more genetic routine of things. So as an imaging fan, I would tell you, no, you have to image. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's beautiful yeast imaging work out there. Um, Andre, do you want to kickstart uh, maybe as well? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you said there were no dyes. Um, the, the other option is you can always order like from origins your your um, protein of interest tagged with a fluorescent molecule. Um, yeah, so that's a very good start. 
Um, the other thing you could do, it's very difficult to give advice since I don't know the complete you know, metabolic pathways are involved, but you could also look at downstream um, indicators. For instance, if calcium is, for instance, one, you could use calcium flux probes that might be able to give you a signal or something going on. I know, for instance, there is many studies, particularly in the oscillatory behavior of calcium or, or as AMPK with yeast, um, where that measures over time and see how the population changes or synchronize, um, which, which gives you wonderful dynamic data, as well as being used to make computational models with. Um, so yeah, so you can look at the tagging of your proteins of interest, or maybe looking at downstream indicators of that process that could potentially, be, which there are already markers for, or dyes or probes for. Thank you so much. I appreciate the uh, feedback. <laughs> Very helpful. Excellent. So Hilary, if I can add to that. So typically I would advise, you know, that one looks at what is possible to label. Uh, you know, with yeast, there are some probes that are inherent binding probes that are available for yeast specifically. Uh, there is experience with calcofluor, for example. I think it's calcofluor for the yeast, for the membrane. And um, I've seen beautiful mitochondrial stain. Uh, there is there are a lot of plasmids for yeast because you have the advantage that you can transfect uh, your yeast colony very quickly, actually. So um, you might be able to get vectors um, with the GFP, you know, uh, linked to your protein of interest. And then typically I would, uh, if, there, if there is a probe available, then uh, I would just start and see how well you can resolve it. And based on that, you then make a decision, you know, is, could you do it in life um, or is it, would you rather fragment it and you say, okay, before and after is good enough and I do quantitative analysis on that, mean intensity analysis maybe, or co-localization if it's about membrane translocation. So it really depends on the specific question. Thank you so much. I really appreciate um, all the input. It's really, yeah, it's giving me a good perspective on what I can do moving forward. <laughs> Excellent. And so typically, um, uh, Hilary, uh, it, it's good to screen literature very briefly, just, just with a focus on what has been done on yeast, imaging-wise, generally, and then maybe specifically within your field. And these papers can then be also brought with you know, you can crop it out. Look, this is here. This is what I would like to achieve. Could we do it? And then, you know, there is advice for, uh, for, for how, to, how to go about it. And then one can decide, uh, you know, if that is um, a viable avenue. Thank you so much. Um, I missed a little bit of what you said. The connection on my side is a bit poor, but I will, I'll go back to the recording and um, actually Excellent. listen to what you said again. Excellent. But thank you so much. Great. It's a pleasure. We, are, we have on the Zoom meeting, we still have eight minutes left. Uh, we are a bit over time, but it's fine from my side. A few more minutes. Are there, are there any more questions? It's very enjoyable. <laughs> Anything else? I see there's... Tarifa, Michelle, Jenna. Any other questions? Comments? Worries? Yeah, I think from my side, I don't really have questions per se. I think that'll more come up when I get started. Um, I'm doing more live organism imaging and viewing. So I think it'll be a little bit different in the application, but I think a lot of the concepts will be applicable. I mean, it's, it's also used in a confocal and with fluorescent imaging and all that very similar concepts. It's just that the, the size of the actual what I'm viewing is a lot bigger. Yes, yes. Thelma. What organism are you using, if I may ask? Bigger pardon? Uh, what organism are you using? Zebrafish. Oh. But yeah, they, they still use an Olympus FE 1000 confocal. 
Yeah. Because we've done we've done larvae before, which was a quite a challenge, an interesting challenge. It took us a while to figure out to get it nicely done, but um, yeah, but that were that were fly larvae though. Yeah. Yeah. That's quite no, cool. I was just um, and I said that I'm not sure how relevant this is to fish, but I know if, but we had quite a problem with Winston Hushed, um, which uh, has a tendency to also stain the um, the chitin. And for instance, we had to find a way around that using chitinase in order to get proper staining and stuff like that. So um, it took us about four a week's worth of good work or good results had about two months worth of just troubleshooting to get the thing to work properly, um, yeah, which is quite frankly quite, quite typical, but um, yeah. 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 Jenna, typically the zebrafish, uh, it depends if it's in life. It's, I mean, it's a beautiful model system for imaging. One has to look at what probes are really, you know, have been I would be strongly guided by literature that you don't that you don't have to reinvent too much, and then of course it's very important with uh, you know immobilization and orientation and controlling the sample actually uh, well yeah. during the acquisition time, and then it's about good image you know quantitative analysis. There might be additional processing involved because there is more background noise and so forth. Um, but there is a lot of good information out there uh, for that. So yeah. it's, it's very exciting, uh, that, that zebrafish development there. Yeah. Thanks. I'm quite looking forward to it. I just need to finish up my soul culture work and main campus side, and then I can start with that. So I, I don't really have any questions yet, because I think questions more arise when, when you're actually getting into it and applying what you've read in literature. But I mean, yeah. literature seems to make it sound pretty straightforward, but I know it's very different when you're actually doing it yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It becomes a bit more challenging. So yeah, looking forward to it. Wonderful. Good. Any last questions? Then I would say Thank you all for your participation, for the interest, uh, for the nice interaction. And uh, Andre, of course, fantastic. And um, yeah, so all the best with your work, with your studies. And, and I can only encourage you to use microscopy in your, as part of your work. As you know, it is an increasing tool in terms of abilities. Uh, you know, we've had this resolution revolution globally we've had you know two Nobel prizes in the field in the last few years so the technology is so advancing that um that it's a very good field to to get skills in so use it for your project and and maximize it it's a it's really fantastic right then thank you all for the time and all the best with your work yeah thank you for your time Thank you so much. Good. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.